Hello and welcome to AutoLine This Week. I'm John McElroy, standing in front of the world headquarters of the Ford Motor Company, because in just a moment, we're going to take you inside and talk to three experts about the future and how we all fit into it. Here is your host, John McElroy. As I said, we're going to be talking about the future, but not just with cars. We'll be looking at a variety of topics, including design, fashion, societal trends, and I've got three great experts to be talking about that today, including Cheryl Connolly, who looks at all global trends and futuring for the Ford Motor Company. Gadi Ahmet, the president of New Deal Design, and you, you're gonna be very interested in some of the things that he's designed. Also joining us are John Gerzema, the executive chairman of BAV Consulting, which I understand is part of Burson Marsteller as well. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Very good. So let's get into it. You know, I, who knows where this conversation is going to go? Let's start out talking about big trends in transportation, or let's call it mobility, okay. because I think that's a better way of doing it. Cheryl, why don't I talk with you to start with in that automakers are facing government regulations all around the world to boost fuel economy, cut CO2, or really greenhouse gas emissions. They're coming out with hybrids and plug-ins, battery electric cars, now fuel cell cars are hitting the market, but they haven't really caught on. Even in the United States, mm -hmm. the largest market in the world for these kinds of vehicles, they're like 3% of sales. How do you think we're going to resolve this? How is the auto industry going to resolve trying to meet these government regulations when the public just does not seem to be on board yet? Well, I think it's all about how you frame the question because I am not sure it's the autom automotive industry that will resolve that question ultimately. And as the in-house futurist for Ford, my job is to kind of make sure that we're looking outside of our industry. We're looking at global shifts, um, societal, technological, economic, environmental, and political arenas we can't predict the future, but we can certainly try to prepare ourselves so that we learn to expect the unexpected. And Ford's strategy in that regard specifically has to surrender to the idea that we don't know. We don't know and we can't know, so we have these parallel paths of innovation where we're trying to improve you know, uh, fuel cells, um, hybrid, pure electric, but we also can do amazing things on just your traditional uh, gas engine. So with the EcoBoost, it's one of our most successful and popular engines on the marketplace. And so you look at um, famous innovators like Clay Christensen, who talk about that the innovation in these things are maybe our best path. Disruptive innovation could be wonderful, but there also could be um, seismic change from incremental um, innovation. So we're trying to cover all of our bets. Gotti, what role does design play in this? I mean, here you're, and, and we, we should let the audience know you've designed the Fitbit, which has launched yeah. a, a revolution in, in personal health and exercise. Is it design that's going to do this? And just to add to that, I, I um, designed a few years ago a system with a company called Better Place that was trying to deploy uh, infrastructure for electric cars. I think design has a major role in creating um, new advanced technologies more appealing and more readily, um, say, connecting with uh, the, the average consumer. I think typically uh, technologies that are uh, right at the cutting edge are not the most uh, communicative, not the most enjoyable, and so on. And if you take a company that does it correctly, let's say like Tesla, they put the whole package together, it's something different. It becomes, it, 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 it is breaking through some barriers and making people uh, gravitate towards the product rather than uh, being convinced or, over, uh, or pushed towards the, tro uh, the product, let's say by regulation and so on. So I'm a great believer in a consumer open market where design has a major role to make these uh, more um, ecologically friendly uh, vehicles uh, more uh, appealing. What would crack the code to do that? I mean, from your, your vantage point, not as an automotive designer, as an outsider. So, so two things in my opinion. One is a highly complex technical uh, topic, which is range and anxiety. How do you deal mm -hmm. with that? But another is something that people don't pay attention to. It's not electric car any longer. Actually, even our gas cars are not uh, gas cars. It's our digital environments. 
We actually text, which we don't like to admit. We have entertainment system. Mm -hmm. We have a navigation system and so on. And people look at that as an extension of their living room in a sense of having a lot of these uh, enjoyable uh, digital uh, uh, gadget, if you wish, around them. And I think there is a way that we could take that digital brilliance and weave it into the car, create uh, opportunities for people to lean back a little bit and enjoy the digital experience, leaving the car to drive a few miles. You know, it's still, you know, a uh, traffic jam and you don't want to deal much with driving. And then later in the, let's say, around the corner when it's open road, you could actually uh, uh, kick into uh, your driver mode and, and, and enjoy the car. So I think digital technology within the car should really leap forward and allow people to enjoy um, digital experience rather than being uh, just mere drivers. Yeah, and I think, yeah, and I think Gotti, to, to build on that point, getting millennials, that's, that's their life, yeah. right? That's yeah. how they think, and if you think about their definition of exploration today, yeah. Our definition of exploration would have just been physical transportation. Yeah. Their definition is sort of digital freedom and digital expression, and so the, the merging yeah. of those two worlds, I think, is incredibly important. Yeah, and I think the just to add to that, the whole uh, topic of ownership of a car is being transformed now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that, for instance, a lot of my designers live in San Francisco, and they prefer not to own a car, but they take a car by zip car for two hours or they use Uber and so on. So all these combinations are going to be out there. I actually think that we'll have a hybrid future rather than mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that we'll have multiple models mm -hmm. and people will hop between these models as they, wa as they wish. So that's actually a very interesting and I think beautiful future. Mm -hmm. It is, I, and you, you know, the millennials are a really great example because you know, they're the youngest members of the consuming market right now and so their preferences can kind of give us a cue as to what we might see in the future. And when we look at yep. the difference between mm -hmm. millennials and baby boomers, you, their attitudes towards a vehicle, or car ownership, or even getting your driver's license are fundamentally different. Yep. So today in the US, uh, seven out of 10 uh, 16 year olds do not have their driver's license. And the numbers are down, not just for 16 year olds, but 17 year olds, 18 year olds, yep. and 19 year olds. And, and to Gotti's point, then miles driven by the people 21 to 30 years of age, also down. So as an automotive manufacturer, we have to ask ourselves, what are the societal influences that are changing? So when, when some of us were coming of age, if you were a baby boomer, for instance, you got your first car, it was a rite of passage. Yeah. It was what we like to say, the gateway purchase into adulthood. Yeah. Um, now our kids, any one of our kids would argue that their first cell phone was their gateway <laughs> yeah. purchase into That's adulthood. So and so we, this, this uh, convergence of technology yeah. and constant connectivity are things that are changing. Um, what mobility means. It is, but John, I want to ask you, there's uh, of course global variations in looking yep. at all this kind of thing. So in the United States, as Cheryl just points out, we're seeing mm -hmm. fewer and fewer teenagers yep. getting their driver's license. Yep. Meanwhile, in China, car sales are going crazy. Sure. There still is that rite of passage that's taking place there. Sure. Uh, how do you see this evolving on a global basis, this, well, this development? <clears throat> yeah, and I think, John, to be a marketer, you've got to obviously look at the culture and the context. And you know, in China, for example, in our data and BAV, we see young Chinese millennials, their aspirations are not their parents, their aspirations are other global millennials around the world. So they feel far more connected to kids their age in other countries. So I think you've got to look at those contexts. I think Cheryl raises a really important point about not only technology and the way that they're thinking, but also we've got economic constraints, you're looking at student loan, uh, challenges here, you know, in the U.S. and in other parts of the world, different levels of disposable income, and all these, I think, have a factor to play. You figure out about how to get get people to um, to drive and to own a car. But I, I want to go back to what Guy said. It was so interesting. I think it's so important to think about the fact that there could be multiple models of ownership. You know, I was uh, at a conference, South by Southwest, and Brian mm -hmm. Chesky was there, and he raised a great point. He talked about the average length of a power tool, right? So if you yeah. bought a power tool today, what's the average length that that's been used? Take a guess. Once. Right, total time. It's only been yet once. 14 it's minutes. 14 right? minutes, oh my gosh. So then that becomes a question. Of course, it's question. been in the garage for 20 years. Right, but so yeah. then it becomes a question of utility, and yet at the same time, you've got you know Airbnb and One Fine Stay and these other companies like Neighbor Goods in San Francisco yeah. that are helping you take your purchases and make them become assets in the sense that they, they continue to yeah. sort of you know, derive revenue for you. So I think it is a multiple sort of yeah. consumer 
producer model that's emerging. And right. I think that the reason why those, that you have to look underneath why those things are popular, and part of it is a financial constraint, right? So Definitely. you've got you got young people, those millennials who were promised the world and an oyster, you know, and the, the job market hasn't received them the way that they had hoped or anticipated, but they do have an appetite for the finer things. And so one way they can still partake in that is to rent, to borrow, to share, to yeah. collaboratively consume. Uh, but even if the finances aren't what holding you back, there are lots of people that say, ownership is a lot of responsibility. It means yeah. insuring, maintaining, yeah. storing. Um, and then beneath all of that, it happens to be a really sustainable solution. But just to, to, to peg into that uh, notion, if we talked about these millennials as people who have uh, a complete digital culture, they're immersed with that, that's their experience. What I think is not there is that the experience of driving didn't become digital. So if I'm renting a car, it takes me a long time until I figure out how to get my uh, phone to, to get the music through the, the, the new car and so right. on. So what will need to happen, I think, is some level of openness by the car companies to allow uh, or to embrace, if you wish, the, this digital culture around it and, and open up so people could have a meaningful hour or two of a, a rental car or a zip car and then they see that they could you know, enjoy it mm -hmm. through their digital way of life and then maybe the next one will be a weekend and so on. So I think there is some kind of a, a separation of experiences. Uh, my generation um, experienced things more mechanically. Uh, maybe my daughters are completely immersed in, 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 in the digital, digital culture and we need to somehow bridge that. Gotti, we're right around the corner. We're going to see autonomous cars, yep. cars that can drive themselves. Will that answer the question that you're or the issue that okay, you're addressing. I, I've been asked a few times about it. I'm actually, um, my view is complex. There are definitely uh, some functions, uh, for instance, people who are disabled or you know, delivering packages and so on, that autonomous cars will be amazing to, to use. At the same time, I think for a lot of people, including millennials, the experience of driving fast in an open road and enjoying it is still there. We are still physical animals. There's still visceral connection to what we do, to the motion and to emotions that come with that. Now, later, around the corner, you drove and you got stuck in a traffic jam. Over there, you probably want to push a button and say, take me home. Mm -hmm. So we will have some, again, a, a hybrid reality in which multiple uh, use modes are going to be used uh, sometimes in a vertical way, let's say to deliver packages, but sometimes my ideal car is a car that I drive for fun and then when I'm getting stuck in traffic, it basically does all that and I could do other things. Hmm. I, I think that um, the, the joy of driving is, is still one of our pillars within Ford, yeah. uh, but the reality is globally, and I think it's Frost and Sullivan that put this quote together, um, something to the extent that the average speed traveled worldwide is about 25 miles per hour. And so there are pockets, it's not evenly distributed, yeah. so there, you know, here in the U.S. there's still lots of opportunities to yeah. have that pedal to the metal, the wind in your hair, the open roads ahead, and that is part of the romantic view of car ownership. Um, but for other parts, that's not a reality. And we've heard Bill Ford, our uh, chairman, talk about his fear. What if we continue to add more vehicles to the road? That that may not be an ideal solution if it yep. creates global gridlock. That and, and the, the dynamic of urbanization. You know, sure. Sammy Hagar back in my day had this famous uh, song, I Can't Drive 55. 55. And I think that's pretty much the norm now in New York and, yep. and in Singapore <laughs> and other places. <laughs> John, you, you look at things all over. Uh, as Cheryl points out, I think there's roughly a billion cars on planet Earth right now. Uh, it, some projections would suggest in a couple of decades we might double that, two yeah. billion cars. Yeah. It ties right in with population growth. We're at, what, six billion now, headed yeah. to nine. What's that going to do to maybe not just mobility, but society in general? Well, it's going to put all kinds of stress on our on our resources. I'm, you know, as a global traveler business person like Cheryl and... Um, Sorry, I totally yeah. say that again. Yeah. I'm so jet lagged. Yeah. So uh, what I think about uh, this time today is that there's this huge shift and I've gone back and like as a global traveler, looked at um, spending time in Beijing in 90s and in Vietnam and, and 
the early 2000s and you just literally saw this dramatic shift, right? Yeah. Going from bicycles to you know motorbikes to cars. So it's a tremendous stress that's going to be put on our, on our infrastructure. Do you see it that way, Gotti? I, first, I totally agree, but I do think that a lot of the solutions are within the design domain. I think we used to have uh, old four trucks that are still out there. People will fix them. Today, you cannot fix a car. You need, sure. you know, you yeah. need a whole shop uh, you know, with computers and so on. And the same thing I say uh, to the industry I'm familiar with, uh, let's say the mobile phone industry, being able to repair and hold to an object, uh, let's say five, seven, ten years, rather than discarding it after two, three years, will solve that problem. Basically, Do you see that happening instead of this disposable I, I, throw away electronics? I see the yearn for that. I know uh, a lot of the designers in my studio bought um, small clunky motorcycles and I asked them why and they said because I can fix them. Mm -hmm. And I like to get my hands dirty with grease and I like to fix them and I could still control it and people like that. So building all these human qualities, uh, people still want to be able to maintain the same, same object, that they have a lot of uh, embedded memories, they just want to maintain it longer. And I think we should, uh, as design community, as in the industries, I'm talking both the mobile industry and the car industry, allow cars and any object to mm -hmm. live longer, be uh, serviced better, maybe uh, change more uh, engines, change digital brain, whatever. This is really a, a crucial uh, challenge for the designers around the world, and I think we can do it. Well, you know, the, the average car in the U U.S. today is 11 and a half years, mm -hmm. so they've already achieved that. But to your point, uh, so much of the technology in those older yeah. cars yeah. is outdated. Yeah. Even in luxury cars, it's outdated, and there's no easy way to upgrade it. Yeah, try to upgrade a Bluetooth uh, software in, in one of the modern cars. I'm not talking about something from the 70s. No. It's impossible. Well, one of the things that actually Ford is trying to address, because you do have this thing, you, you have a, a, a durable good, a, a car that's a, a decade old, you got a cell phone that's a couple months old, yeah. and you, wanna, you know it's going to change. And so we actually do have this open architecture to try to make sure that we can stay abreast of that. And we've engaged in many more strategic partnerships, so uh, we're not just looking at what other auto manufacturers are doing, we want to know what other consumer electronics providers are doing. So we have a program called OpenXC where we invite we have taken proprietary systems yeah. and made them open source so that we can tap into the minds of yeah. these two and have them collaborate and make the, the vehicle experience better. And I guess fundamentally then you start to say, you know, companies like Ford don't see themselves as just selling off vehicles, but we're selling mobility in all shapes, sizes, and colors. I think that also taps into the mindset as we were discussing earlier of the next generation car buyer, right? They're yeah. thinking in terms of apps that are buggy you know my yeah. daughter said to me well this yeah. app is a little buggy yeah. you know they got to work it out well they understand there's versions of 2.1 yeah. 2.2 and everything yeah. and so yeah. this is a, a far more organic process i believe yeah and i think um, i think th the good news is that we are now suddenly aware of it there is a big word called interoperability between you know software and hardware components and in cars you always feel it you know there's one part that is still hearkening back on uh, technology that was tried and true for the last 30 40 years and then there is a new bluetooth thingy that is buggy mm -hmm. and so on and and uh, that is part of maintaining the life of a car or of any object is again making sure that it's uh, fully functional and enjoyable very important i mean i actually want to chime in here I am not sure the term mobility is giving us enough of these human uh, emotional values. Mm -hmm. It's a very utilitarian mm -hmm. uh, uh, economics. I mean, uh, you know, professors of economics will use it. I think to some degree we need to find, and I understand why it's used, I, we need to find a new vernacular that will embed the emotional side of the experience of new quote unquote mobility with the utility of it. I, I completely agree, um, and I, I think there's an irony that you know we talk about our mobile phone, and yeah. you know, but when we talk about that mobility, we're not talking about the same mobility in terms of yeah. planes, right. trains, automobiles. Yeah. But at some point, there is in the abstract this intersection, yeah. Yeah. and I would it actually takes me to a different point that you know fundamentally one of the questions that Ford is trying to answer is what is the future of mobility, and I often say as a futurist that 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 
question can't be answered until you figure out things like what's the future of work? You know, how many people will work from home? Where will there be mm -hmm, virtual yeah. employment? And you can't answer that question until you understand the future of education. And the future of education mm -hmm. will be about government stability yeah. and economic inputs. You know, so you start to see just how complex um, and holistic tackling yeah. these problems become. And, and yet, I just to, to back to that, to me, the anchor is the human being. Mm -hmm. We still want to interact. So a lot of the experiment with remote workers uh, didn't really deliver. And we've seen, for instance, Yahoo actually called everyone in back. Mm -hmm. we, we are interacting now, we're enjoying it. it there's, there's nothing that technology could actually deliver on that. And w with that said, what I want to say is we should be more mature with expectations from technology. Technology cannot solve education. Cannot, technology cannot solve issues with workplace and so on. So we will still be traveling to meet people because we humans, we are social animal. We want to interact with people and enjoy it. The question is how are we going to do that? How frequently are we going to do that? What's going to be the journey like? And we, we actually try to track this. We, one of the trends that we published in our 2014 trend book was this battle between the fear of missing out, which is yep. you know, <laughs> created, um, the modern take on that is that constant connectivity, but it's up against this idea about the joy of missing out. How do you make sure that you live in the present, that you have the, the fulfillment of having undivided attention towards a single activity, a single conversation? Yep. It's becoming harder and harder, but I think as it becomes more harder, the more valued it gets recognized and the more um, people struggle to make yeah, sure yeah. it becomes a reality or part of their daily yeah, experience. Yeah. It fundamentally it comes back down to human connection. Yeah. Well, we had two uh, data points on, on that, Cheryl, from our research. This was fielded last week, but one of them we thought was kind of interesting, uh, survey of just of Americans, quantitative survey in our data. 19% of people, only 19% felt that they were really good at living in the moment. Yeah. So I think that there's this sort of technology dwarf thing that's happening too on, on top of everyone with the way that they think and, and live. I, I just want to second that. I think one of the biggest challenges I have in the day-to-day -day communication with clients, and some of them are the largest uh, tech companies, is to push back against this massive wall of data that is attacking you as a human being and you want to basically sift through the clutter and get only the relevant one and be able to be in the zone and actually enjoy it rather than being bombarded or chased by that. Yeah. And that's a, a huge challenge for the tech business um, and to some degree it reflects on what happens now in cars because people text while driving, and they will continue to text no matter what we'll do, because this is part of their experience. So we need to change that experience to allow them to enjoy the moment of driving and listening to music without being chased by events. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. and I think it gets back to the joy of driving. Yeah. I, I think you have to ask yourself, that part of the reason autonomous driving is of so much interest is that people are basically saying, there are things I'd rather do than be behind the yeah. wheel of my automobile. Yeah. Yeah. And in that, rush hour traffic. In rush hour Going traffic. Going back to what Gotti said, though, is on a beautiful open country road with the top down, if you have a convertible, it's awesome. You don't mm -hmm. text there. No. Right. That's for sure. I could guarantee you that. <laughs> and it's and this isn't a problem just for drivers. I mean, we w in the work that we yeah. did with John, we talked about the number of pedestrians that are, you know, they're walking and texting or, or yeah. talking. And and we actually cite a statistic that talked about the number of pedestrians that have shown up in, in hospital emergency rooms due to text, cell phone text related accidents or injuries has <laughs> increased, I think, 300% well, in recent years. Yeah, and our other data point that from our research from last week that we just fielded is 78% um, of Americans would uh, give up sex before their smartphone, which is an <laughs> indictment on uh, something. I'm not going to go No wonder this country is. is all yeah. messed up, right? <laughs> We've got our priorities wrong. Yeah, very interesting. It, is this taking over our lives completely then? I think that's what we're saying. I mean, I think that for every trend, there's going to be an opposite trend, and I think we're seeing a lot of that in, in our work. You know, you see the rise of, uh, of a company like Etsy, yeah. something like well over $3 billion in sales, which is about handcrafted goods in a very organic sort of physical marketplace. I think that's exactly So the there idea. is this conflicting messages here. So people are amazingly viscerally connected to their mobile phone and through that to the digital world, but they're hearkening on yesterday's craft. And right. the one they, they right. want to have their own uh, 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 you know, little tchotchke that they did, and, and they want to sell it and want to share it. 
It's less about making money out of it as, as, as to say, hey, I can do it. And, and, and these are two powerful um, uh, elements that for me are a, a, an amazing opportunity for design. How we mm -hmm. create meaningful, personable objects that are still delivering this digital experience and sometimes not always, sometimes. Mm. So crafted, handcrafted, crafted. craftsmanship is exactly. going to play an element even though it might be with a high-tech object. A ability to customize, personalize, craft your experience, which by the way, the car industry is way better than the, the, yeah. uh, the tech uh, industry, way mm. better. About 25% of uh, the car is more or less uh, your own selected options, uh, both on utility, like you know, engine and so on, but also on color, you know, uh, type of seats and so on. Um, but again, I see that as a great opportunity. Yeah. With that, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap this conversation up. I could listen to you guys all day long, but I want to thank you all for having come on AutoLine this week with me today, including Cheryl Connolly from the Ford Motor Company, Gadi Ahmet from New Deal Design, John Gerzema from BAV Consulting. It's been awesome talking to the three of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.